Hi, I'm Helen Quinn from Dairy Australia. Thank you for joining us in this important discussion. The Productivity Project is an economic research project that we've undertaken to progress the Australian Dairy Plan profitability discussion, which highlighted that dairy farm productivity has been flat over the last decade. To help get today's discussion started, we've spoken to six respected people from across the dairy industry and asked them what can be done to improve productivity in the dairy industry. We do our pasture utilised each year and, and fundamentally it goes up and down one or one and a half tonnes predominantly with the season. But we're not seeing a continuing trend, uh, increasing trend of being able to utilise more. I think it's probably because we're not seeing a, uh, a trend to growing more. As DA chair and somebody that's sort of looked on with hope about the emerging technologies of um, dairy bio and various breeding programs coming forward, um, that 20 to 30 percent increase we're hoping for and expecting out of those programs really becomes critical because we haven't had a step change in in the ryegrass varieties for a long while. We need to ensure we have access to new innovation and technology, it's things such as gene edited ryegrass. And when the productivity gains are realised, we, we have farms and people to invest in. So I think one of the key things the industry needs to look at is attracting new people into the industry. So to try and have a larger workforce in general, but also to try and bring new ideas and new enthusiasm into the industry. Uh, also to re-look at the RD&E side of things, um, to make sure they're looking at the, how it impacts the whole farm, not just individual areas on the farm. I've been around long enough to know through the 80s and the 90s, you know, we had some massive productivity gains and, it, and a lot of it was based around technology. You know, there were new sheds, there were bigger sheds, there were better ways of uh, managing pastures, there was ABVs, there was genetic gain, there was all of these things that we could grasp. Um, so I think technology going forward is going to be a big part of moving the industry back into positive productivity. What that technology looks like, I'm not quite sure, but I suspect some of it will be around uh, labour management and certainly some of it will be a, around the day-to-day -day management of the farm, whether it's, you know, putting out fertiliser or, or whether it's, you know, managing the stock or whatever. We've just got to find better ways of doing things faster but still to the same high standard. The answer to me is better research, better respect for levy, levies paid by farmers, better science, better economics, freeing up the creativity of good scientists to do good science and making good investment decisions about where we spend our research funds. I feel that productivity growth will come from understanding and unlocking the potential of our resources, our land and our water, our cows, our people, and the modern technologies and knowledge that has been developed over recent years. Investing in skills and opportunities that create greater efficiencies and better returns on our assets. It's not about reducing inputs, it's about making them work better. There's some food for thought to get this discussion underway. So I'll hand back to our host, Sarah Thompson. Welcome everyone, back to our third and final session of the Productivity Forum. It's fair to say this has been a really interesting experience for the team working behind this. As each week, we are discovering what the research is saying and then quickly working out how that will be presented at these sessions. It's been a fast paced, agile process and we've loved being able to bring you this information really hot off the press. Now the plan for today's final session We'll head straight into a Q&A with Dan, Tom and Gavin as they tackle some of the awesome questions that have come through in the productivity email. Then we'll hear from Gavin Dwyer one last time where he will share the possible consequences of competition for dairy, land and resources and what this may mean for the industry. And then to help broaden our thinking on this, we have guest speaker Lucinda Corrigan, a beef farmer from New South Wales who will share her perspective from outside of dairy. Then finally, as promised, 
we get to tie this all together by seeking the industry response to this productivity work where Colin Thompson, James Mann and David Nation will discuss how these findings will influence our d &E investment moving forward. Now, before we start, as always, just some quick housekeeping tips to maximise your experience today. If you can and your internet permits it, um, please pop your camera on. Our speakers do love to see that they are engaging with actual people on the other end of this screen. With your Zoom screen in the top right hand corner, you will see um, that you can switch between gallery view and speaker view. I suggest that you select speaker view so that you can see us nice and close when we're speaking. You will also notice that there is no chat function at these sessions, and that is intentional. Instead, uh, you'll see there's an email address above my head, uh, which is productivity at dairyaustralia.com.au. Please do continue to send your questions, comments and feedback through to this email. Just because the forum will be finished doesn't mean that the dialogue has to end. Uh, the question submitted through here really does help progress our thinking with this space. Whilst we simply can't tackle all the questions in these forums, we will provide a written summary of all questions back to participants after today. So you can see what was asked, who asked it, and the answers to those questions as well. Now, as we promised, today we're gonna to kick off with a Q&A segment to ensure we can actually tackle as many questions as possible. And as per usual with each week so far, we have received a large number of highly technical questions um, from the likes of Daryl Poole, John Hoysier, um, some um, Sam Atchison, Ian Morris, Ken Lawrence, um, Lockie Barnes, just to name a few. And look, many of their questions are quite technical, but relating to how we've measured things. And luckily we have had reassurance from the likes of Bill Malcolm, who you saw in that video, um, and he reassures us that the work that Gavin and his team have done is the world's best practice economics methodology. And we are using standard measures of input and output incorporated into it. I hope that provides some reassurance. Um, to get us started with the Q&A today, I do want to jump straight into a topic that has been a key theme coming through our email. And that is numerous comments from people saying to us, but hang on, it's profitability that we care about, much more so than productivity. Now, there's definitely an important technical distinction, but the two are direct re directly related. Um, we touched on this a bit last week, but I'm also going to um, ask our consultant on the line, Tom Farron, to help clarify this for us again, because it was such a key topic. Tom, I'll hand over to you. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So first of all, I'm going to break this answer into two parts, and I'll just apologise for the hardcore economics, economics amongst us, because um, this has hit my understanding of it rather than necessarily the 100% technical accurate answer. But the first part of the answer I'm going to say is that it's important to understand what's meant by productivity. So this whole report is based on productivity. Um, I think it's quite a common thing to get that confused with total production. So rather than talking about the total production, we're talking about what the actual productivity is. And to understand that, my way of thinking of it, it's how much output or production we are getting from the actual inputs. So it's all relative to the amount of inputs that are going in. Um, so simply increasing level output doesn't necessarily give you an increase in productivity. Um, an example I'd use is if a farm has currently got a 100 hectare dairy farm and they're milking on that and nothing else changes on that farm, but they go and buy the neighbouring 100 hectares. And as a result, they produce 10% more milk. Their actual, while their production's gone up by 10%, their actual productivity's decreased because they've got more um, inputs going in to get that output. So that's sort of part one to understand what productivity is. Part two is to understand why we're focusing on productivity rather than profitability and how the two are likely to be connected. So profitability is largely impacted by T two key components um, and those being the terms of trade and the productivity. So what I mean by the terms of trade is things such as your milk price and your key input prices with like grain for an example. Um, and unfortunately for most dairy farmers in the dairy industry in Australia, there's not a lot of influence that can be had on a lot of these key terms of trade ones like milk price, for example. You might be able to negotiate contracts and stuff to smooth some of that milk price out, but largely it's still influenced by the um, world markets a great deal. 
Um, same with grain and hay prices and those sorts of things. You can do some stuff to smooth it out, but overall you can't dramatically change the terms of trade. So therefore that area that is more controllable is the productivity side of it. So the second key component for profitability. In other words, trying to get more from your inputs that are actually used. Um, so we know that sounds like a blanket rule that um, to try and get an increase from the inputs but we also know that sometimes that can make farms less profitable as well. So we're certainly not talking about ignoring the marginal economic returns or lower diminishing returns in regards to that. We all know of examples where farms have increased an input um, or really, sorry, more focused on an input. So I'll use the Northern Victoria example where water use, so megalitre efficiency has become the key um, for a lot of farms that focus on. And we quite often see that as they do that, they change crop types, change farm system types, and may not end up being profitable, as profitable as they were. So we've got to be aware that that's not a blanket rule, but generally speaking as a whole, if the dairy industry in Australia is going to remain competitive, so both on the milk price front, because they're competing worldwide against, um, so both domestically and internationally against other competitors. So even if the Australian market shrinks to just being a domestic market only, we, everyone that goes to the supermarket is very aware that there's still a lot of imported dairy products coming into Australia. So it's always going to need to remain competitive in that regards. Um, and the other one is they need to be competitive against the other agricultural industries. So an example we're seeing at the moment is Southwest Victoria, um, the, the likes of the sheep and the beef guys that are often outbidding dairy farmers for the, the properties as they come up. Or in Northern Victoria, we're seeing water being bought out by the um, horticulture, horticulture guys. Um, so to... to remain competitive both worldwide and domestically for the resources. Um, productivity is the one thing that industry can try and control and put focus on to try and improve the profitability and remain competitive. So Dan might have bits to add to that. Thanks, Tom. Um, Dan, any quick comments from you um, in relation to what Tom's outlined there? And I just, um, yeah, consistent with Tom, yeah, productivity is the, the part of profitability that we have the most ability to influence and I guess in you know when it comes to measuring the performance of our research development and extension investments productivity gives a much better reflection of performance uh, with the terms of trade being taken out it um, you know allows us to focus on the efficiency of using inputs to create outputs which is a much more valid way of um, measuring performance of our uh, DNA investments. Fantastic, Dan. Um, look, thank you both um, for you know the simplification of, of and and the clarification of that. And I hope that does help those that have that have submitted questions on the, on this area. Um, it, it, with the tone of technical um, questions, um, Gav, I've got this one is definitely coming to you. Um, our next question is from Scott Barnett, um, who is a farm consultant who works across Victoria and New South Wales. And he asks us, um, am I correct in reading that the figure quoted or graphed for each index, such as total factor productivity or output oriented scale efficiency, is the annual percentage change in that index? So Gav, can you weigh in on that one for me? Sure, good, really good question. Um, short answer is no. Um, it, it, it's calculated as an index. So if it's one at the start of the period and one at the end of the period, there's been no growth. Uh, we deliberately didn't calculate growth indexes over time because quite simply, there are so many points in time that you could choose from to measure that. So we'd have numbers going all over the place. What's simpler is for people to simply look at that index over time and look at the shape of the graph. And they can choose the points they wish to choose uh, looking at that from. Uh, if the graph is inclining over time from the points that they choose, then productivity is rising. Uh, there's a growth in productivity. And if it's declining, then there's a decline in the growth in productivity. Fantastic, Gav. Thank you. And look, thanks, Scott. And thanks to all of those people that are um, submitting technical questions. Um, I guess what they help this team do is really fine tune and clarify the information that we do have at hand. Um, now, our next question comes from uh, Gippsland Dairy Farmer, uh, a Gipps Dairy Board member and Data Gene Group leader, Michelle Axford, who I believe is also online. Now, Michelle wants to know if mix efficiency is impacted by delayed spending on repairs and improvements. For example, in a year when the terms of trade are poor, repairs may be delayed and carried forward. 
the impact could be that it looks as though costs are well controlled and therefore mix efficiency improved. Now, that's a great question, Michelle. Um, Dan, I might go to you first to help us answer that one. Yeah, it is a good question. Thanks, Michelle. Um, yeah, I guess, um, you know, in the way we collect the data, we try to avoid those things as much as possible. But the reality is that things like delayed expenditure on repairs and maintenance does often impact between years on the performance. I think, um, yeah, this highlights the importance of having continuity of farms in the data. Over, if you have the same farms over time, those, those issues tend to sort them out in the long-term trends in farm performance over time. If you have the same farms participating, it'll just move the, move the, um, the issue from one year to another and the, the long-term trend will, will still be the same. Uh, but in terms of whether that's reflected in a mix efficiency or not, uh, Gavin's probably in a better position to answer that. Okay. Um, well, pardon the pun, but the effect on mix efficiency can be mixed. Um, it depends. Um, certainly in some of those transition years where we come out of a particularly hard period of drought or um, um, commodity price shock or so forth, um, after that period, we certainly do see on farms where there's a movement to reconsolidate. So expenditures that were delayed, such as investing in pasture improvement, um, uh, investing in, you know, maintenance and so forth that's been delayed, those are caught up. And certainly that can have an effect on mix efficiency, depending upon how outputs change, and they may change and increase far more rapidly than the increase in those inputs, those incremental increases in inputs. So sometimes we might not see it, sometimes we do. Uh, that leads to the really key point, and that is that we try to avoid looking at productivity shifts on just a yearly basis. It's far better to think about productivity as a long-term trend, and we're interested in its long-term trends. So, these types of issues then wash out over time. If we look at it over a long enough period where we have a number of those shocks through the period, we tend not to worry about it too much because it comes out in the wash in the end. Um, so avoid looking at a shift in an individual year. Look to the long-term trend. Thanks, Dan and Gav. And look, some really considered questions that are coming through. And I think that points to the importance of um, the, the quality of the farm data and having those farms involved for quite some time, but also the long-term trends here as opposed to short-term. Um, now, look, moving right along, um, South Australian consultant Sam Atchison has submitted a detail, detailed response to, to the work that's been done. Um, among his questions to us was this one. Has any consideration been specified to look at other external factors that may have impacted dairy businesses over the past 20 years, other than environmental or climate change? He says there should be a fifth component, other external factors, added to the left side of the flowchart under productivity effect in figure one. Sam in his email to us provided an extensive list of external factors he sees in his home state of South Australia and suggests that they have all had, impact, had an impact um, on the calculated total factor productivity values. Um, our panel have had the chance to review Sam's full document. And Tom, I'm wondering if you might kick off the response. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So first of all, I'd just like to thank Sam because I actually really enjoyed reading through that. Um, it's really good to see some of the local context and understanding of what some of the things that influenced it over there. Um, and this part, I'll probably hand to Gav to talk about a little bit later. But the first thing to also mention is that South Australia is a very varied state as far as the dairy systems there. So we've got the, the South Australian pivot type farms, and then we've got the, some of the smaller farms in the Adelaide Hills. Um, and so it's important when we're to understand when this data is collected, it's come off a of very wide ranging types of farms. And the other one I think, but you might be able to clarify this, is that the consistency with the same farm staying in the um, dairy farm under projects changed a bit over the years as well. So all that's going to also have influenced these results as well. Um, the other thing I'd say is that when we look back at the last 20 years, there's no doubt there's been incredibly volatility and there's all these different reasons that have affected um, essentially productivity growth. Um, but if we look back the previous 20 years or 30 years before that as well, we've seen that there's been obviously a lot of change through there. So it's a bit before my time 
that age bracket. Um, but you look back at the number of dairy farms that are around in the 1970s compared to what there was by the 1990s. So there's obviously been challenges the whole way along. Yet during those periods, particularly the 80s and 90s, we seem to have seen really good productivity growth through those periods, despite the, the challenges that every decade's had. Um, and yeah, so I personally are on the same view that climate change isn't really to blame. It's a personal view for the lack of productivity growth in the last 20 years. So I want to, yeah, me personally, I don't think we need to focus on that as the key reason. Um, it's just one of the many contributing factors. And one of the things that makes me say that is when I looked at Gav's slides last week um, on the Northern Victoria, we could see that there was actually a bit of a productivity bump in the 2006, 07, 08 period before the global financial crisis, which was actually when a major drought kicked off. Um, and so the farmers really turned their focus on to getting the most out of the inputs they currently had. And we actually saw that yeah, a lot of farms learned a fair bit, as stressful as it was during that period. And we saw a productivity growth despite resources being more limited during that period. Um, and I think a part of the problem we've got at the moment is that we had such a good period of productivity growth through the 80s, 90s, early 2000s, that a lot of that low hanging fruit. So the farmers understanding of nutrition and pasture management and stuff like that grew exponentially through that phase. And we also had some good new technologies come through such as superphosphate, probably back before that, but urea and glyphosate and all those sorts of ones. In the last 20 years, I can't name a single one on that level that's happened. Um, so I might hand over to Gav now just to talk a little bit more about the South Australian effect on the data. Uh, thanks, Tom. I think you've covered quite a fair amount of territory there. And um, with South Australia, there obviously is an issue for us with the relatively small number of farms, I think there's about 20 or 30 in the, in the sample set in South Australia, and they do move in and out of that sample set. And there is a large diversity in the types of farms that move in and out over time. So that can affect those productivity numbers. So we're certainly more cautious in interpreting the results for South Australia than for other regions, simply because there's more volatility and it suggests that there's something going on there. It's true that there's certainly a lot of things that we can incorporate into that um, set of environmental factors. We've simply looked at rainfall and temperature and we've done a first pass at some potential cuts of, of how that could be impacting and there's certainly more that could be done there. We're not picking up at the moment um, or able to incorporate issues such as topography, soils and other sorts of local factors that are going to drive productivity results that will be important as those individual types of farms move in and out. And certainly there's a wide array of external factors that can sit outside. Uh, there's more work to be done here down the track. And this is something for DA to think about is to look at some of those um, factors, look at some of the characteristics of the farms and the, and the path dependencies of where they have been and where, are they, where they're going to, that can influence and influence the shape of productivity. But there's probably a caution there that we need to be careful in interpreting that because, um, you know, it's, it's the long-term trends across a wide number of farms that, uh, that matter. And uh, we need to be careful that we don't end up benchmarking an individual farm against another individual farm and trying to learn or say, well, you should like, look like this because that worked for someone else. It might not work for you. Fantastic, Gav. Thank you. Um, and look, a huge thanks to, to Tom and Dan as well. Um, I think the Q&A is a really great way for us to get the practical interpretation of this data. Um, and as we know, um, this data will keep evolving. It doesn't just stop here. Um, we'll keep learning more about it. I am going to play a Just Sorry. to show we're live, my lights went out and they're back <laughs> moving. So uh, this is not pre-recorded. <laughs> I did see that, Gav. Um, now, I will pull a Q&A up. Q&A up there just because I'm mindful of time um, and what I'm really excited about is the fact that we get to start getting into the final piece of the of the productivity pie. Um, this week um, our, our thinking turns to competitiveness and Gavin's study has highlighted the consequences of competition for dairy land and resources with other agricultural industries. Um, so Gav really keen to hear more about this it's over to you. Thanks I'm just going to share my screen now uh, and bring the presentation up. So I'm assuming everyone can see that screen now. We're, we're good to go, Sarah. We've got it. Thank you. Excellent. So look, put simply, competitiveness is really just doing better than everyone else. Um, and as farmers, uh, dairy farmers, we compete um, not just against 
um, the dairy farmer over the fence, but uh, the beef or grain producer down the road or uh, in the other region. And we compete against uh, local businesses in town for resources uh, and internationally as well. We compete for them for basic things like income and the resources to fuel the production of our inputs. And critical thing for our business as dairy farmers is, are my outputs sold profitably? Can I get a decent profit from selling them? And can I affordably get the farm resources that I need to produce those outputs? Now, in this analysis, we keep turning to rd &E as a driver of productivity that drives profitability, that drives the answer to those questions. In Australia, when we go and look at it, industry public rd &E, um, shapes that competitiveness through shaping productivity. And we estimate that to be in the order of about $60 million per annum. That includes industry contributions, federal government contributions and state government contributions. Uh, outside of that, of course, there's the private sector and universities and um, other bits and bobs that can add considerably to that. So that number could be considerably larger. But that 60 million is really important to us in shaping some of those answers. And let's just remind ourselves why that is. Well, productivity drives the amount of inputs that are required in the long run. So if I'm less productive, I'm going to need more inputs. Needing more inputs just gets harder to source them. And we also know that productivity weakening limits our profitability down the track. And as we're less profitable, I'm less able to afford and fund their purchase in the future. So weak productivity does end up affecting and creating weak competitiveness. And that's really important to understand. Now, often we hear about land as sort of, you know, the litmus test around competitiveness. Uh, it is, uh, it is in the long run, but there's some um, swings and roundabouts that go through here. And there's some nuance that probably is worth reminding ourselves about. First up, we can substitute land with other inputs. And over the last 20 years, that certainly happened in the dairy industry. Um, it's lumpy. Uh, it's hard to buy in the ideal quantities and get the timing right. So sometimes it's hard to get the productivity right because you can't necessarily buy the best parcels of land to do that. And we're dependent on those localised circumstances, such as the, you know, uh, where we are and what that looks like. So that can affect the types of farming systems we can choose. Um, it can affect amenity values. If I'm nearer to a local town, um, I'm probably going to be paying more for land and certainly planning laws are going to affect what I can do. And it's going to depend on the characteristics and infrastructure that are nearby. It's also going to be depend upon personal circumstances and, you know, succession and retirement and so forth. So, we also know that that demand for land is going to be driven by some larger macro factors regionally. For example, the availability of water, which Tom talked about earlier on, is a really great example. And also, we know that those relative differences in productivity between regions that are reasonably large can be very important over time, affecting the, um, the willingness that we're prepared to pay for land in those regions. Now, this leads us to this paradox where increasing productivity can mean more and less land is used in the future. So first up, we can end up with the retirement of marginal land and less productive farms. And we can see the growth in land intensive dairy farm businesses over time. So the short answer is the patterns of change can vary considerably. That's actually really hard to quantify and estimate. Um, and we have modelled that directly at this point um, for some of those reasons above, and um, it's important to be cautious about that. What we have done is done some modelling to look at the regional implications and the industry implications of different scenarios of competitiveness. We don't know what the future will bring, so we can only think about future scenarios, future possible worlds. The first one is that we model is productivity falls and we don't offset those terms of trade losses that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks. The second scenario is productivity rises, uh, but they're, and they're just enough to offset. So we have no losses from the terms of trade. And then the third scenario is um, we're probably in clover where we've got larger productivity gains that exceed the losses from the terms of trade. So we're doing pretty well. What we do is in the model we use um, the level of RD&E expenditure is the tool to shift that 
that change in in productivity in the model. Um, and we've got some estimates of some changes in those levels to 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 um, shift that in the model. Um, we assume all those changes um, come from farm contributions and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, we do that for simplicity, but it also gives us actually a really nice and interesting insight out of it. And we also assume that other businesses, uh, so other agricultural industries that compete against us, they're just doing business as usual. So whatever their productivity growth rates were before, we assume they continue. And before we get into it, let's just remind ourselves that we're using an economy-wide model. So there's some limitations with that, but also some advantages. We incorporate the dairy industry and agriculture into it. Um, it provides estimates at a national, regional and industry level of those con consequences of competition for resources. But we also need to remind ourselves of a really important subtlety, and that is that productivity can be a double-edged sword in regional economies. So as dairy farmers, as we produce more with less, it improves our farm business profitability, but it does alter what services we then see. So, um, and those services might not grow as fast or indeed they may even shrink. And that can have consequences for regional economies as dairy productivity improves. Let's look at the first scenario. I'm just going to look in each of these examples at um, Warrnambool Southwest as, a, as an example region. Uh, these are available, uh, will be available in the report for all the regions um, uh, across Australia. So you can delve into the, the devil in the detail. In this first one, we look at weak productivity and weak terms of trade. Uh, the national impacts of that are relatively small, only a loss of $170 million. Well, why is that? Well, because those resources not used by dairy get used by someone else. Uh, so at a national level, uh, we don't see much of an impact, but at a regional level and at an industry level, those, those impacts are quite important and significant. And they hit hardest in regions where we have dairy as the greatest share of industry in that region. And Warrnambool Southwest in Australia is the region with the largest share of dairy that has a derived economy from it, uh, over 8%. So in that region, when we have a weakening productivity and weakening terms of trade, the labour market um, gets weaker, our input markets weaken, uh, employment falls by about 1%. And that decline in the terms of trade means that we don't invest as much in the region as well, in our farms as well. And that translates back through into the regional economy also. The second scenario that we look at is a productivity gain uh, but there's no terms of trade losses. So this is a sweet spot where we just offset those terms of trade losses with an improvement in productivity. Now, under this scenario, national welfare increases. So overall, as an economy, we're actually much better off. We end up at about half a billion dollars better off overall. In a place like Warrnambool Southwest, where um, dairy is an important part of that regional economy, that has a big effect. Our real GDP, that is the amount of output, the value of our output accounted for by inflation goes up quite a fair bit and that's important. But as we talked about that double-edged sword of productivity, when we look at that at a regional economy level, there's actually a little bit of a, a bit of an impact there in a negative sense for employment uh, and regional capital. Because we're doing so much better with our productivity, we're actually sourcing fewer resources and that flows through to the local economy with a slight weakening of the local economy. The final scenario that we look at is larger productivity gain that more than offsets the terms of trade. So we're in clover on this one. Uh, national welfare goes up about 1.5 billion. And when we look at it carefully, there's virtually no economic loss in the Warrnambool or Southwest region relative to the base in terms of those um, other elements of the service industry. So that real growth in GDP comes primarily through the, that increase in the value of farm output at the farm gate. Now we talked right at the start about this model only using a shift in farm income. So, uh, sorry, a shift in uh, farmer paid levy, um, funding the R&D. Now, when we've got that going on, we've got dollars going out of, out of a dairy farm into an RD&E uh, effort, and that comes back to us with new technologies that we implement on the farm and we do better off overall. And what's interesting about this analysis is that it shows that in all cases, in every case, there's far better regional outcomes when we get government paying more of that upkick 
in the RD and expenditures to fund the productivity improvement. That's because fewer dollars leave the region. Some of the benefits from the RD&E get shared with consumers. Um, farmers capture some of that. And we're able to offset some of those weaknesses in the local regional economy as a result of that. So overall, we're far better off if we can get um, improvements in RD&E. Uh, at this point, once you account for the, the levels of expenditure already being funded by farmers, improve that through further expenditure from the public purse. And we'll hand over back to you, Sarah. Sorry, Gav, thank you very much. Couldn't find the mute button. Um, look, th thank you, Gav. And look, I, I'm sure many people will be wanting to get their hands on um, their regional <laughs> um, graphs and perspectives so that they can look at it in a bit more depth. Um, but really important information that you've covered there. All right, now next up, I think it's really important for us as a dairy industry to not always just be looking from a dairy perspective, but also be thinking about it from an outsider's perspective or a different industry's perspective. Um, so that's why we've asked uh, Lucinda Corrigan, um, who's a beef producer, um, she's read the research report and she's actually here today to share her perspective. Um, now Lucinda Corrigan and her family, they're based in the Murray Valley of New South Wales and have been farming there since the 1870s. She's passionate about genetics and has always kept her eye on dairy. Um, and some may know that she's actually also a director with Data Gene. But beef is her main game. Today, we're asking Lucinda to talk about what she's learned from the dairy productivity research and the challenges from her perspectives, um, perspective that she faces as a beef producer. Uh, Lucinda, we are really excited to hear from you and your perspective. Um, so I'm gonna hand straight over to you. Thanks, Sarah, and thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I'd like to say at the beginning that I think productivity flatlining is something that's um, an, a similar issue across agriculture. And there's evidence of this for the last three decades. And I'll give you a couple of examples of that. Firstly, I just want to say what a great piece of work this is, has been done here by Dairy Australia and, and um, Gavin and the people involved, because I think to highlight the technical efficiency of the dairy industry in the report, 75% um, of farmers being technically efficient between 90 and 92%, I find absolutely remarkable. And I would surmise that this is way ahead of other livestock industries. I think some of this is due to the professionalism of the dairy industry and the fact that people don't fall into dairying, they tend to choose it. There are much greater barriers to entry for dairying than say sheep or cattle farming and grain farming. And particularly in the area where I work, which is the production of genetics, it's very easy for someone to buy a few Angus cows and go out and hang their shingle up and, and, and sell stud bulls. But I think the barriers to entry for dairying are greater. In the beef industry, there's a massive tail of competency, skills and experience. And this is, to a certain extent, masked in the current environment by very favourable terms of trade. So I just think that this work you're doing at a granular level is really important and um, it, it sets up, um, I think, for the future and thinking about what's, what, what should be, where the investment should be. I just wanna give you an example of the cereal industry. Um, analysis by Dr. Zizi Hoffman from CSIRO a couple of years ago, 2019, shows that Australia's wheat industry has yields have declined, yield potential has declined by 27% since 1990. And this is really significant from 4.4 tonnes per hectare to 3.2 tonnes per hectare. Yield potential is defined by the combination of um, sun, temperature and plant density. And of this decline, 83% is accounted for by a dec decrease in in-season rainfall and only 17% by increased temperature variability. So why have grain yields remained constant? And that is the big, um, that's because of the investments in innovation and adaptation, with grain farmers increasing their average yield potential from 38 to 55% over that period. So the best grain farmers are now achieving over 80% of the yield potential. And when you think about that, you can see that they're actually, it could be about to hit an adaptation ceiling in terms of where they go for future improvements. I've really enjoyed the discussions about scale because scale is something that you certainly see a lot of in terms of people increasing their business viability in um, certainly in the beef industry. I've just spent a week at Rockhampton at Beef Australia. The scale option is interesting because data says that scale doesn't increase productivity. My view is scale creates choice. 
because you have a higher net profit, if not higher profitability. These profits are then available for investing in labour saving infrastructure, new innovation or upskilling of the workforce. So the big thing, of course, is what is what's around the corner in terms of technology farming systems dealing with volatility and who's going to compete for capital. I, I don't think, you know, and obviously we're in a bit of a purple patch at the moment with beef and sheep, the beef and sheep industries, but I don't think that um, those broadacre industries are a long term competition for dairying. I think it's much more likely to be the water based industries and, um, and really not other livestock. When I think about productivity improvements, I always think of um, a matrix of about four factors. The first is animal genetics and genomics, which accounts historically for about 30% of productivity improvements. And we've had this big disruptor over the last decade with genomics. I think dairy is very well positioned to, to continue to take advantage of, of genetics and genomics because of the changes you've made to the dairy infrastructure that delivers genetic improvement. Oh, the big one is pastures and soil health, and obviously new technology, genetically modified um, pastures, gene editing, etc. I think are going to uh, are the sort of the next frontier. But I want you to think about um, animal health, welfare, and the environment. And immediately you'll come back to me and say, "Well, that's not going to improve productivity." But I think um, there's a national conversation now developing about uh, reducing waste in the production system. So I call it reducing the negative. So if you think about improved calf immunity, pregnancy rates, um, the work on reducing emissions and emissions intensity has a dual benefit of improving productivity and lowering emissions. And uh, that's, a, that's a big story, which I think um, also deals with our social license to operate for our livestock industries. And reducing waste is a really significant conversation in other production systems, such as the northern beef industry, where reproduction rates are much lower. So then you think about the how, how we deliver um, what we do in terms of um, how we make decisions. And I've, I caught the role of digital technology is really where I think the frontier of um, getting those incremental improvements in productivity throughout the system. And uh, the, the Precision to Decision uh, large research project funded by Rural Research for Profit um, came up with some figures of around 15 to 20 percent improvements in productivity if we can get those digital platforms. So I think the fourth pillar of product increasing productivity is this facilitation of decision making through intelligent data platforms. When up at Rockhampton in the last couple of weeks, um, there were lots of shiny new ag tech offerings. And a lot of these people are, um, I think, delivering solutions that possibly are solutions to questions we're not asking. I think many players have entered this space and we saw a lot of them on show. And the role of the National RD Investor in Dairy Australia is really to help producers sift through these offerings to make sure that they're answering the questions that are, are applicable to your business. So thank you very much, um, Helen and the team and everybody, Sarah, for, for the invitation and very happy to um, continue the conversation. Fantastic, Lucinda, thank you. And look, it's really lovely to hear your praise about dairy farmers and the industry more broadly. Um, and we're glad you share our enthusiasm um, for this piece of work and the fact that it has been done. Um, I think you've you know, outlined some really great points there and really brought um, an element of positivity to this conversation about what does lie ahead and where those productivity gains might come from. So Lucinda, thank you for, um, I guess, looking over the fence and giving us that other perspective um, on dairy productivity. Now, Gav, I'm going to swing back to you in response to what we've heard from Lucinda and then taking into consideration the work you've done in this space. I'd love to come to you for some closing thoughts and messages for us, everyone in the dairy industry, to consider. Sure. Um, and I'll be quick doing this because I think you've already heard enough from me already. Um, I'll just share with you just a, a couple of thoughts. Um, I think for the industry, to me, it's a couple of really simple things. It's old truth revisited. Um, it's really important the farmers get the right signals so that they can make incrementally choices on their farms well. I think for too long, uh, earlier on during this period of analysis, we had price signals that were very difficult to understand and was difficult for farmers to predict what their incremental changes would be. I think secondly, just making sure that we don't have unnecessary red tape and regulatory burden in the way of farmers so they can get on with the, the needed changes uh, on their farms. 
Uh, and third is obviously optimise r and &E funding uh, and, and get the investments right. Build the pipeline of really good research and innovation, challenge the scientists to, to provide it and use good economics to assess it um, and build a balanced portfolio and translate it into on-farm changes. I think for farmers, um, you know, I, I hate preaching to farmers because, um, geez, they know this stuff better than anyone. And it's the old, don't predict, prepare. We don't know what the future certain world will be. It will be what it will be. We just need to be ready for that. So make the most of the efficient home resources that you've got. Start at home first and do the best you can there. And then see, get stuff outside where you have to. Um, we know things are going to get volatile. We're going to have more structural change. We know we need to harness the upsides. We know there's some foreseeable technologies out there that Lucinda talked about. Get ready for them. Be prepared for them. And um, know in the long run that change is going to be a certainty if we want to be around. And to do that, you need to be prepared as a business and as a person. Um, so it's being about flexible and, and openness to change. You're going to have to learn to like the new type of farm business that evolves. Um, you're going to need the skills and the knowledge to be able to implement the technologies that come along. You're going to have to get that balancing act of strategy and tactics right. And you're also going to have the capacity to fund those types of changes on the farm. So for me, they're the quick snapshots of what really needs to be done. Awesome, Gav. Look, thank you. And look, I think some really important points there. And I know because of time, we've had to rush through them, but certainly we will make sure that we're communicating those clearly out to this audience as a result. Um, but as always, appreciate the, the effort, um, the time and the, I guess, passion that you have for this area. Um, and particularly the fact that you've been with us for three weeks and presented this great information. So thank you, Gavin. Now, um, speaking to the audience now, well, we, because we have jam-packed so much into this session, we are running a little behind time. So I am going to ask your permission that we may go um, about five to ten minutes over um, uh, the time today. I'm hoping that you will stick with us because the next part is really important. Um, we promised you, um, firstly, in this forum that we'd um, focus on understanding productivity. Um, then we went to what is happening with productivity and we really understood that from a regional perspective and now looking at other industries and, and dairy. Um, but now it all comes together here with what will industry do in response to this new research and the tell -tale telling findings. So look, to get that industry response, today we turn to the dairy industry's leadership to respond. You'll see rejoining us today, we have Cowra, New South Wales dairy farmer. Um, he's also the president of New South Wales Farmers Dairy Council, and he's also Australian Dairy Farmers board member, Colin Thompson. We also have joining us Dairy Australia chairman, James Mann, located in South Australia. And we also have Dairy Australia managing director, David Nation with us today. Colin, I'm going to come to you straight away. Um, you're one of the many who has now had a really good go at reading this research and this work. Um, you've commented on it on numerous occasions. Um, what do the findings for you suggest that we need to do at an industry level response? Yeah, thanks very much, Sarah. And um, and I do think that this uh, forum and this productivity paper is um, it's breaking new ground for our industry. Um, it, there's been a lot of very useful information for farmers around the country, but also it has put the spotlight very much on our industry organisations and, and I believe it will set a platform to, to launch new developments, uh, new research, new ideas that um, they can pass back to farmers. And, and so some of the, uh, I guess, some of the key um, messages that, have, that I've received out of this, out of this uh, forum is that um, many have said that it, it confirms what we suspected. Um, I think we'd all been surprised if the report had found anything but a flat lining in productivity for the last 10 years. And I think that just confirms the accuracy and the validity of the report and the work that's been done. Um, we've heard that uh, we've already picked the low hanging fruit. So I guess that means that uh, to see gains now and to see changes, we're going to have to dig deeper. We're going to have to learn new uh, new technology to, to do more research uh, so that we can continue to provide uh, productivity gains for the industry. We've heard that we need to invest in technology that improves productivity. Um, so 
uh, we can't just keep doing the same thing and, and getting the same result. We're going to have to make changes and, and to learn better how to, to adapt new technology on farm to ensure that we do get gains. We also heard that we need to collect, keep collecting data. Uh, this, this productivity report has been made possible because of data that's been collected for the last 10 years or more over the industry. Um, and we need to keep monitoring it. We need to keep doing it. We probably need to broaden the base that, uh, that uh, we've collected this data from. From an ADF perspective, um, I guess some farmers are, and many farmers are probably feeling a little disappointed and maybe frustrated that the much muted uh, single advocacy organisation and, and R&D organisation uh, didn't eventuate. But and those discussions, reform discussions are ongoing, but one thing that we have really learnt from those discussions and negotiations is the need to work closer together. Industry needs to come together and work together to not duplicate things, but, but be able to just um, understand what each other is doing and so that we can really deliver um, better results. Um, I think this, uh, this forum, is a, it's a, it was a joint initiative from ADF and Dairy Australia. And it's a clear example of how industry um, can work together. And, and so this, um, this paper will set a, a platform that will uh, launch very relevant work, ongoing work. And, and, and one of those uh, um, things is that we do need to, it's very clear that we need to uh, see continued research development and extension in the industry that is focused and targeted um, very specifically on increasing productivity. For ADF, perhaps some of the things that we can get out of this report is that, uh, uh, and we've seen it's been highlighted, the um, negative impact that terms of trade can have on the industry. And, and that's something that we can use going forward. And um, as we seek to lobby for a better position for dairy farmers and uh, take that message to Canberra, whoever else we need to take it to. And, uh, and now we have something very solid to, um, to ground and, and to back uh, the message that we take. So Sarah, without uh, taking up too much more time, I, I'd like to uh, commend everybody that's uh, been involved in this project. It's been a very worthwhile and productive um, project. And, and I think Sarah, maybe we've uncovered a new talent in, in your hosting of this event. It's been a great job. Thanks very much, Sarah. And so, um, yeah, thank you. Thank oh, you. thank you, Colin. Um, I don't know about that, but um, I really appreciate your input here and your involvement throughout the Productivity Forum. We always get such considered thoughts from you that are really valuable. Um, and look, I totally agree. Industry collaboration is key to getting positive outcomes from here on out. And look, I think you're right, Colin. The spotlight is on industry organisations here. And so with that in mind, I will move on um, to our next panel member, um, so James Mann. So James, many who know you know that you have a passion for innovation and a desire to push the envelope without compromise. James, the report is challenging us not to rest on our laurels. And we heard only from last week, only last week from Jackie Bidoff in WA and Michelle in Tasmania, who issued some really key challenges um, in the RDE space. So James, um, I'm keen to know your perspective. Do you see our industry responding to the productivity flatline? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, absolutely. Um, equally, I'd also like to say to the team, uh, Helen and Gavin, like really good work, um, going to be really, really useful for, for us to um, work out how we respond to it and to put a real baseline in, in our thinking going forward and probably absolutely endorse Colin's views about we can't just let it go past us. We've got to keep on this productivity um, bandwagon, for want of a better word, uh, going forward. Um, so from a DA point of view, um, you know, innovation and, uh, and farm innovation and farm productivity is our core business. It's not our only business, but it's our core business. It's what, what we're really set up to do. If you listen to the minister, you listen to the RDC framework, it's all around innovation and innovation on farm. Um, and it's not just the science, the sexy bit perhaps about making the new discovery, but it's about refining that discovery and then about um, the extension of that discovery to make sure that farmers actually pick it up and use it. So it's okay discovering the best bit of science and the best widget or gadget or something. But if, if it isn't working for me and Colin and whoever else is wanting to work for them, Lucinda, um, then, it, then it's really not worth much. 
So we need to be really focused on making sure that we continue to do that. Um, I think we've done it pretty well, but can we do it better? Absolutely. Um, and the sort of, and I think it probably underlines to me that we need some step changes. And Gavin's work saying, you know, keep crawling along. You're not going to actually make those jumps. You've got to start getting the step change. We want a step change, um, particularly perhaps around feed base. Um, and I think we're probably going to reap a harvest that our forebears sowed probably 20 or 25 years ago. Um, so I don't think it's new, a productivity game. Um, I think whenever the first CRC started, you know, it's, it's, it's probably longer than DA's been in existence, but somebody had some remarkable foresight to say, you're not getting enough out of your ground, go and work out how we get more productivity from, from our pastures. So it's going to be, hopefully the first crossbred ryegrasses will hit us 2023, 20, 24, 20% more, um, same dirt, still got some development to do around it. Um, still got to make sure people adopt it. Although personally, I think farmers will be queuing up to buy that one. I don't reckon it will be a hard sell, um, but I, you know, certainly how we farm it, how we fertilise it, how we graze it, what the stocking rate's going to be, all that sort of development work still got to happen. So really looking forward to that. And then if I look forward, further down the pipeline, um, the uh, gene editing stuff, uh, again, in, it, it probably in C3 grasses, but annual rye grasses as well. So it'll be sort of applicable across most of the dairy area to some extent, um, probably 2030-ish. And again, another 10 to 20% on top of what we've already got. So some sort of stuff coming down there that, that I'm pretty excited to in, in, in feed base. I um, also think dairy buyers are you know, in, in another reinvestment phase now. And, and the way we're describing things is, you know, what, what's our farm gonna look like in 2035, 2040? We really need to be thinking, uh, and we're gonna be wrong, guaranteed we won't describe it exactly but we'll be able to describe roughly what it looks like um, we'll be roughly right what 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 are we going to do now which will help us farm through that period of time with some productivity increases 15 to 20 years out um, and we need to imagine that uh, and we need to be brave and we need to be slightly unconventional um, and we need to to, to recognize that we've got to have some uh, not big bets, but but some bets on some stuff that will probably fail. And that's okay, because that's what collective risk could do. But some of them will succeed, such as the crossbreeding in ryegrass that we're about to harvest, whatever it is. Um, and that will be, that'll be a win, but it's going to be needed if we're going to keep in the, in the game. And we've got to keep in the game if we want to have a, well, I want to keep in the game. If we want to have the next generation coming into farm, we've got to sow those seeds as, as our four people did. Um, so that's pretty good, I think, in the, in the pasture bit. The animal genetics, I uh, couldn't agree more with Lucinda. If I look globally around the world, um, health traits, um, uh, definitely the, the in words, and whether you're gonna do it with immunity plus or whether you're gonna do it with transition right, whatever it is, there's a whole raft of them. Um, I think the global, I think the genetics genomics business is quite global. Uh, I think there's a real focus on minimizing imprint, footprint, environmental footprint by um, feed saved or by uh, more fertile cows or longer living cows. Um, there's a whole raft of that info coming, that science coming. Again, dairy bio, uh, um, dairy bio has a, has a place to, to, to play in that sun. We need to shape where we think it needs to go. I think the interesting bit will be methane for one of them. Um, you know, for, we're already world leaders in hot in breeding cows that handle heat. That'll keep going, and there'll be some other traits that, when we think about what our farms may look like in 2035, 2040, we might need to to think about there as well. So I think we've got some good things coming, Sarah. Um, we've got plenty of work to do. Um, and I'm you know, thinking uh, really interested in Gavin's um, stick another five mil on the table. Um, 
where does that go? And and if you looked at that, I mean, five mil up, and you, I think Gav, I've remembered one point five billion for Western Victoria. That's that to me, that's a that's a no brainer. Um, we'll be pretty interested to make sure we land that one that one right. So plenty of good stuff to happen, um, but plenty of work to do. Um, so that yeah, that would be my thoughts, Sarah. And um, I think we've just got to dream big uh, and then get science to come in behind it. Great comments there, James. And look, thank you. Um, and I think we've certainly got a vote of confidence to you about this productivity work and also some confidence there about what industry is doing. Um, but noting your comments, we've done it well, but we can do better and we need that big next step change. So some really important things for our audience to keep in their mind. Now, last but not least, David Nation. Um, now, Dave, we've heard from Colin and James with some really great perspectives on what this means and what next, possibly. Um, so I'm really interested for you. Do you think these productivity findings will influence um, how we target RDNE going forward? And then I wonder if you might also comment on if we need greater blue sky effort to get that next step change that James is referring to. So over to you, Dave. Great. Th thanks, Sarah. And thanks for all the speakers who've spoken so far. And really, for everyone who's made this whole three-week journey <clears throat> worthwhile, and I hope really it has been worthwhile for all, all the listeners. Um, there's there's a lot of information that's been packed into three episodes, a lot of good questioning, and as you said at the start, Sarah, this is there's lots of this this like all good science that whatever you find generates more questions than answers. So we 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 very much understood that going into this process. We very much um, it's fantastic to be able to commission work like this. It's fantastic to be able to take a, 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 a genuine deep look at what is happening with productivity in the dairy industry and make a make a meaningful contribution to the discussion. So it's one it's it's a great thing to do it. It's a great thing to understand it, but it also has to be a great thing to respond to it. Now one of our challenges that I think has been a theme in all this discussion is new productivity opportunities don't just magically appear. And so, and, and there's been commentary about how, you know, most of the great things that have happened to any agricultural industry and the dairy industry included, come off a long run up, very patient investment. Um, the, and the patience comes from a clear economic analysis to say that there is a real prize in this. So joining the dots of some of the things that Bill Malcolm has said is economics is required to give us patience, a really clear understanding about the potential win from, from a productivity opportunity that presents itself. And then science has to be given a chance to do what science does best. And again, as Bill Malcolm described, that, in, that includes a fair degree of flair and creativity, all under the context that there's a, there's a big win in this, and it's going to drive productivity. And I think that's one of the features of what we've been trying to do for a long time at Dairy Australia, well before my time, continuing in, with, in this role and will continue to be well into the future. Long-term custodians of making an economic case for a significant investment in R&D and then committing to that R&D and giving scientists best chance to deliver that R&D. That is, that is what has delivered the greatest gains for this industry in this last period of time. When I, when I think about the, the greatest hits of what's just been described, when we think about how the cow is changing because we now understand its DNA makeup, that's a 20 year journey to create that opportunity that's now being harvested by multinationals on a global scale. When I think about pastures and I think about how excited people are about how different that grass in my background is going to look in a few years time, that, that is not a short run thing. That, that is a 10 to 20 year journey again of making most of the opportunity. What I really like about this analysis is that, that there's a, there's a um, splitting out what drives productivity. Well, first and foremost, that productivity isn't a dirty word because for a long time, in fairness, productivity has been a dirty word because it's been in the vernacular a, um, a word that says you're not working hard enough. 
But really what you've tried to show, Gabe, is this is not a stick to beat farmers or people with. This is actually an essential thing for an industry to be successful. And it's not about working harder. It's about technology that has to be found and delivered. And then it has to be adapted well. And it has to face into the challenges that we have as an industry, which is that scale isn't always a productivity driver, whereas it is for a lot of other industries outside of agriculture and a lot of other agricultural industries and where the environment is challenging. So we have to find productivity opportunities. We know we need to find them in, in the things that are closest to home. I, I think that's a really good point at the end as well, Gav. The things that we can most um, plan for, our feed base, our herds, our people, and the technology that we can adopt and the decisions we make as a consequence of doing that well. And our challenge is to continue to drive how effective we can be with our regional footprint. It, it is a real strength of the dairy industry to have a presence in all eight dairy regions. It is, a real, it is a real necessity to get the most out of that capability to drive home the opportunities that present themselves. And, um, and, that, and that can only get better and better as we get better as an organisation of um, positioning opportunities for farmers in a way that farmers better understand. And, 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 and likewise, farmers also challenging us to say, what can we deliver for you? And that's a sweet spot where technology gets adopted that much faster and harder. If we do all that well, and we continue to make the big bets in things that we think patiently are going to be the things that drive the future of the dairy industry, and we continue to make sure that anything that we can deliver and anything we can also bring in from overseas, we can adapt really effectively in this country, that gives us great hope about changing some of your lines on a long-term basis, Gav, and giving a genuine sense that there's productivity gains to be had. We, we, think, there's those, we think those opportunities are coming in the, in the grass space, in the animal space, and in the data and decision-making space. We have to catch them. We have to make the most of them. That's what's good. That, they're going to be key to changing your long-term graphs. And with that, maybe I'll hand back to you, Sarah. Thanks, David. And look, I guess a massive thank you to, to you, Colin and James. I think it's a great way to finish this forum with, you know, a really genuine and honest whole of industry perspective on the future from here. Um, and I guess it's great to be left with a sense of confidence about what's coming next. I think all of you have acknowledged that, yes, there's work to be done and, yes, some change, you know, needs to happen. Um, but we have got some great things happening um, and, you know, the future is sort of paved in a great way for, for what lies next and what we can do collectively um, to work towards, you know, improving productivity. Um, look, everybody, that brings us to a close of our final session of the Productivity Forum. Uh, this whole project, right from the start, from the research, um, through each of these sessions, to the questions and engagement from all of you, has been a really important step towards a more robust conversation about productivity and profitability in the dairy industry. And it doesn't stop here. This has provided us with all the facts and data and the different perspectives that we need to have a more informed conversation about the future of our industry. Now, a couple of reminders. Remember, if you want more detail, the draft report is available to read. And following that, we will be creating some communications that help to translate the research into key messages really clearly based on feedback from you. We'll also be sending out shortly a feedback survey that we'd love you to fill in. It's so important for us to know what you've thought of this entire process and the last three weeks. The productivity email behind my head is still open, so I'd abs absolutely encourage people to continue sending questions, comments and feedback. As I said earlier, it really does help us clarify and refine the work that we're doing. I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of the people that have been involved in this productivity process. It's been a massive effort to do things differently. We've done it in a fast and agile way that allows you as the audience to get this information straight away. And the commentary from those panel members that have been involved in these sessions has been absolutely invaluable. And look, lastly, I'd like to say a massive thank you to everyone in the audience who has joined us for one or all of the productivity sessions. Um, you are the most important part of this process. And I encourage you to use the past three weeks 
as a platform to continue this conversation in your networks so that we all play a role in changing productivity for the dairy industry in the future. Thank you very much and goodbye.